This program is being presented in order to open up a number of questions that need to be answered if Americans are serious about ending terrorism. The war on terror has placed our fighting men and women in harm's way. And if terrorism comes to America on the scale it has other countries, it will also place our police and firefighters in harm's way as well. In addition, our military and law enforcement in the name of fighting terror are being asked to engage in activities which violate their oath of office to the Constitution, specifically our Bill of Rights. They should not be forced into this position knowingly or unknowingly. There is more to the war on terror than meets the eye. The first question we have to ask is, what is terrorism? Terrorism is not simply acts of violence, nor is it an individual acting alone. Terrorism has a purpose, a political purpose. Therefore, the terrorist has an end in mind, at least his superiors do. The terrorist may not even be aware of what is really behind his attack and perform his mad act thinking one thing while his handlers are aware of the real intent. Terrorism has two primary purposes. One, to bring down the existing power structure, the government. And two, to force a change in the policy of the existing government. The latter is almost always to make the government more totalitarian. Therefore, the process of change actually occurs within the minds of the people more than in the government. Examples of the second tactic abound in the 20th century. One of the most famous was the Reichstag fire, which enabled Hitler to virtually declare martial law by blaming the communists for the act, reacting the German people into the acceptance of total government in the face of a contrived national emergency. Most historians believe that the fire was actually started by the Nazis themselves to provide the excuse to clamp down once the act was carried out with a plan already in place. Likewise, the Bolshevik communists in Russia used the reaction to acts of terror engineered by the forerunner of the KGB, the Chetka, to provide the excuse to clamp down on their own people. They used this reaction to eliminate any leadership opposed to communism and executed them as terrorists. Once they had total control, any pretext of terrorism was dropped and the gulag system of concentration camps replaced it. Understanding the reasons behind organized acts of terror, one has to ask what the motivation was for the attack on the Twin Towers in New York City on 9-11. The first reason for terror does not make any sense if they're trying to replace the American government. We're too big, too diverse, too decentralized to affect a collapse of the government by way of one mad attack or series of attacks. Therefore, the purpose must be to alter the policies of our government and have the people accept them. The people of the United States are too free, have a great deal to say about our government at, at all levels, local and national, to be collapsible. The argument can be made that we've lost some of this ability, especially in the 20th century, but we still remain in essence a free people able to regain all of our freedom if organized well enough to do so. Osama bin Laden, ostensibly the leader of Al-Qaeda, made a revealing statement shortly after 9-11 that gives us a clue as to the reasoning behind his act. He boasted, the battle has moved to inside America. I tell you freedom and human rights in America are doomed. The U.S. government will lead the American people and the West in general into an unbearable hell and choking life. There can be no doubt in his mind what the purpose of his organization is. It is to react the American people into standing still for our own government becoming more onerous and in the name of security to clamp down on the basic freedoms we have always enjoyed, indeed which our government was originally founded to protect. Interestingly, what was revealed shortly after 9-11, reported briefly in the world's media but largely ignored, was the revelations of KGB defector to the West, Lieutenant Colonel Litvinenko. He stated that al-Zawahiri, the second in command of al-Qaeda under Osama bin Laden, was a trained Russian asset 
of the KGB renamed FSB. Alexander Litvinenko paid with his life for this and other revelations. Two Russian agents spiked his teeth with a radioactive substance in England which caused Litvinenko to have a prolonged, excruciating death. This means that the Russian handlers of al-Zawahiri knew 9-11 was being planned, financed, trained for. Agents infiltrated into the United States and widely coordinated, so widely coordinated that some in the intelligence community believe that the size and scope were too big for it to have been handled by al-Qaeda and that a state-sponsored intelligence operation had to have been involved as well. The various acts of terror blamed on al-Qaeda or groups linked to al-Qaeda range from Central and North Africa across the entire Muslim world. They are almost daily occurrences. If you stop and think about it, this sort of organization is too large to hide if it exists at the level of blame, unless it has state sponsorship, protection, and or direction. Intelligence bureaus have the capability to listen in on every means of technological communication. Osama bin Laden was monitored 24-7 up to 9-11, and our intelligence system knew his every move according to a PBS documentary. Then we were told he disappeared into a cave in Afghanistan and from there to run a very large, extensive network from Africa to Indonesia. This does not compute. The link between al-Qaeda and Russia is not an isolated incident. In most cases, as, as, as with al-Qaeda, is masked behind Islam. For decades after World War II, the Russian communists built a worldwide organization of terrorists. These organizations were run by Moscow, but made to appear at the street level as disorganized, independent operations. The manner in which this was done was for the KGB to use a surrogate state, the Bulgarian secret police, for instance, to operate a terrorist group inside a third country, such as Turkey. This group would then carry out acts of terror in a fourth country. This, this created layers of deniability, and Moscow could play the game of cooperation internationally while actually running the terrorist show. This is exactly what happened in the attempted assassination of Pope John Paul II in 1981. The assassin was from a Muslim country, Turkey. But the orders led back to Moscow through Bulgaria. While Gorbachev later portrayed a moderate image to the world, he was one of the leaders of Russia, as part of the KGB, who signed off on the assassination plot. Since the so-called collapse of communism, the Russian KGB, FSB, has added a major element that gives another layer of deniability and at the same time increases the possibility of major conflict among people that can lead to more opportunities for Russia to negate the influence of America among the nations of the world. This has been to make terrorism appear to be entirely Muslim in origin. The Muslim Brotherhood is known as a linchpin of the radical Islam movement. In an article in the Brotherhood on the New York Times of October 13, 2001, is this quote. As Father Yakin, one of Quadab's disciples, wrote in the 1960s, the groundwork for the French Revolution was laid by Rousseau, Voltaire, and Montesquieu. The Communist Revolution realized plans set by Marx, Engels, and Lenin. The same holds for us as well. We believe he means more than simply stating that they are the groundwork of an Islamic revolution, for they are referring to the socialist conspiracy of the ages rather than the Koran as their model. What makes this so significant is that this Egyptian-based organization supplies the philosophical underpinning of the radical Muslim movement. The tactic of a wolf in sheep's clothing comes to mind. However, not only can one sneak up on the sheep, by providing religious animosity, you can get the sheep fighting one another, splitting them up with quarrels, and they become ripe for the slaughter. The rise of social revolutionary mullahs in Pakistan, urging the peasants to seize property in the Swat Valley, gave rise to an article in the New York Times of August 2, 2009, that also referred to the wider organizations of Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Sadr army of Iraq being involved in social justice. 
a euphemism for the socialist agenda. Examples abound of the communist terrorists of the 1960s and 70s becoming Muslim, Christian, and Jewish clerics, selling Marxism disguised in religious clothing. Most, however, became Muslims. In the United States, H. Raph Brown of the Communist Black Panthers and Stokely Carmichael of Burn Baby Burn fame became Islamic religious leaders. Likewise in Europe, the most famous communist terrorist, Carlos the Jackal, became a leading author of radical Islam. These men and many more did not change their aims. They only changed their clothes. As a result of the idea that terror is simply Islamic, the eyes of America have been focused on the wrong enemy. Nonetheless, to be successful, the terrorists must have allies within the government they are trying to change. This has to be true in America, or we must have the dumbest people in the world running, for instance, Homeland Security. I have witnessed personally too many instances of security that makes no sense if, one, the problem is Islamic, and two, terrorism is a real threat. We could double the length of this DVD just discussing personal experiences where Muslims, foreign-born Russians, and others are on board American aircraft as cleaners, baggage and food handlers, even aircraft flight personnel. We are talking about American airports and companies. We have also been told by security personnel that these people are not screened as much as the passengers. Is this stupidity or design? Security at American centers of transportation seems to be aimed more at the citizen traveler than at the people employed who could well be a danger to the traveler. Exercises carried out by the Coast Guard and others at the order of Homeland Security are quite intimidating, aimed at small pleasure craft, carrying families on outings, speeding up to them in small, fast boats, armed with machine guns and staring them down. This is not hearsay. This is something that I have witnessed. Sadly, we even witnessed good people applauding the exercise of the orders of Homeland Security, violating the Constitution of the United States for security's sake. We have to keep in mind that government rarely relinquishes power. If the purpose of terrorism is to alter the face of America into a less free country, the goal of Osama bin Laden, then the Patriot Act and how it was passed takes on a greater significance. For the over 340-page Patriot Act had already been written beforehand, then submitted to the Congress within hours of 9-11 and passed without a single congressman reading it in its entirety. Many did not even see it prior to the vote. Is the American landscape being altered? Any traveler on an airline knows that it is. Violations of our Bill of Rights are now a constant occurrence in terminals and on any mode of public transportation. Americans, as their counterparts in other countries have done, are allowing their freedoms to disappear in the face of a national emergency. Benjamin Franklin once admonished the American people by saying, Those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty or safety. The face of America is changing. A decade ago, prior to 9-11, the American people would never have tolerated what is going on today in the name of the war on terror. In addition to changing the face of America, again, the goal that Osama bin Laden had in mind, on the international level, there is a push to merge our country into something called the New World Order. Their words, not mine. While the war on terror is not the only excuse being used to establish the New World Order, it is an important part of the initiatives. Such luminaries as diverse as Henry Kissinger, George Bush the Elder, Gorbachev, and China News, a communist Chinese newspaper, have called for the New World Order in the name of establishing peace and the war on terror. Interestingly, Kissinger has been named to a Vladimir Putin established Russian committee to fight terrorism, supposedly a joint Russian and American citizens group. Kissinger is the co-chair as head of the American section, Yevgeny Primakov, former head of the KGB, who at one time personally ran the communist Islamic terrorists 
is the Russian co-chair. It is the official policy of the United States to establish a new world order in the name of providing security. The national security strategy of the United States, signed by President George H.W. Bush, so states. Since then, we have also seen the Sun establish the Security and Prosperity Partnership to merge our country with Canada and Mexico in the name of providing security. There is more to the war on terror than meets the eye. We are told that Russia is our ally in the war on terror. They were also our ally in World War II. When the war was over, Russia had communized Central Europe and most of Asia as a result, some ally. We have shown herein only a small portion of the tip of the iceberg of evidence that exists demonstrating that Islamic terror is in reality the old communist terror dressed up to look Muslim. The hatred being bred by the idea that the terror emanates from Islam rather than Russia could well be used to incite our people into an even larger conflict overseas than we have now and providing the basis for entangling alliances designed to create a new world order. Are there problems concerning the religion of Islam and the American system of government? The answer is obvious if one discusses the separation of church and state. In a radical Islamic state, the church head is the state, as in Iran. While such Anatolas or Imams may appear to be strictly Muslim, there is scant difference between their rule over free speech, freedom of religion, etc., than a Russian communist commissar. In the end, it's power, regardless of the label, and the state militia in such regimes is usually called the Revolutionary Guard. Let us leave you with one thought. If the terrorism we see is Islamic, why therefore are the vast bulk of terrorist acts against Muslims? The bomber may be Muslim being used by his handlers, but the higher you go in the terrorist organization, the less it is Islamic and the more it is again seeking power. The Muslim population themselves will be just as much the victims of radical Islam as anyone else, more so in fact. The Muslim world was not ruled by imams for centuries. So what is behind the move for radical religious leaders to rule Islam? Systematic terror on the Muslim people is designed to replace what they have with a completely totalitarian and centralized system that will look a lot like the old Soviet Union. So-called Islamic terror has more behind it than the simplistic idea of Islamic terror only. It is a scheme to impose totalitarianism over the Muslim world and to eliminate any pretext of following our Bill of Rights in this country. We again have only told you a very small part of the story. We have written a large number of articles documenting further the basic theme of this DVD. Please go to www.exposingterrorism.com for more information. Once you've informed yourself, please inform your congressman and ask him to adhere to the Constitution, no matter what the temptation may be to provide a little temporary security. They have, after all, taken an oath to uphold the Constitution. We need to make Congress understand who the real enemy is. Your help in this quest is greatly needed.